The world is more complex than ever before, moving and changing at an incredible rate. No one is immune, not even the most successful leaders of today's best-known companies. We are taking the global industry to new assumptions, beyond agile and business agility. Be ready to understand the science behind high uncertainty and accelerated change. Be ready to challenge your organization. Join us at the Enterprise Agility World Conference to know more. The largest event on science, organizational change, and enterprise agility. Enterprise Agility World Conference. The place where science meets organizational change. Hello, hello everyone. We are just live here from the Enterprise Agility World Conference Studios. We are making sure we are live. We're live 100% live and we are here just to try to work with you in different topics, in different things that you understand that there is a world beyond Agile and beyond Business Agility. And there are so many things we need to have in mind when you know, we start talking about um, things that might be controversial for some or might not have the knowledge. Uh, and, you know, there are, in this world, there are so many things we can talk about, so many interesting things. And today, one of those days. So I'm glad you are here with me. I'm here from California. I'm just making sure you understand. And then that um, I'm just checking the streaming here. Oh, that is great. We are live. The streaming is good. I'm making sure that um, everyone is there on the other side. So also, guys, today, don't forget if you have questions, use the chat box, ask questions. We want this time you to ask a question. We ask so many questions all the time, but I want you to influence this conversation. Um, today, before going for our guest, I wanted to welcome Silvia. And Silvia is in Uruguay. Thank you very much for joining today. Silvia has been... Um, you know, in the HR or people world for many, many, many years. She's a consultant and she's going to be helping me when she knew that Zoe would be here. She said, I want to be there. And it was very late yesterday. I don't know. It was like one in the morning when she said that. So thank you for joining today. And I want to welcome also Zoe to our Enterprise Agility World Conference Studios. Zoe is an organizational psychologist and she has been working in everything related to you know, how we can build better organizations with healthier people. And today the topic is quite interesting. As we are going to be talking about burnout. And burnout is such an amazing topic that um, when we talk about burnout, people do not understand that this deterioration process is not in one day. It's not like one day you just wake up and you have a burnout. So many things happen here. So Sylvia, help me out with some questions. Where should we start here? Um, and welcome, Zoe. So where you are today? Hello, Eric. Hello, Sylvia. Thank you very much for having me over. And uh, I wish you both a wonderful conference for this year. I am actually in Athens, Greece, this small country with, uh, with uh, a lot of fencing ruins. You might have heard of it. Yes, yes. I, I, I was mentioning just before joining that um, it is one of the few countries where I've never been. I've been trying to go there. Every time I try to go there, something happens. But hopefully soon it is changing. Now we like the ruins you mentioned. We don't want to ruin the organization, and and, and burnout I think is is very important. So Sylvia, I pass the ball to you. You start with this. Let's just start this great conversation today about burnout. Okay, thank you, thank you, Eric, and thank you, Zoe, for being here with us today and sharing all your expertise about this very important topic, which um, it's it's. It's driving a lot of um, things, not only in, in the in the normal personal environments, but also in, in the workplaces, right? So um, the way I understand burnout um, is that it refers to the mental, physical, and emotional um, state 
uh, and this is as a consequence of suffering chronic and or prolonged situations of stress, right? So uh, how would you um, say um, um, it can be prevented, right? So this, uh, this type of silent condition uh, can be prevented. And I, I can say, or that's my personal point of view, that that's a silent condition because it takes some time um, to identify that. And as Eric mentioned, uh, this is not happening overnight, right? So, mm -hmm. and, and that's because it is silent, because it takes some time to identify um, when someone is going through burnout, mm -hmm. right? Uh, thank you very so, much for this question, Sylvia. Uh, for mm -hmm. starts, I think that it is very important to state that burnout is not a diagnosis in a sense that it's not a disease. Uh, it is a syndrome and uh, it has a lot of different symptoms that can look like stress or sometimes they can even look like depression. But it is related, like you mentioned, to prolonged and chronic uh, work-related stress. Now, the way we have to prevent it has three different angles. For starts, we have the organization and what the organization can do to prevent uh, burnout. Then we have our colleagues that should act our, like our support system. And then, and I might say above all, it's the personal angle and the personal responsibility of each person separately for their own mental health. Let's focus uh, on the organizational side. Most organizations don't really seem to be caring about burnout. They like to talk about it because it's a very modern and very hot topic and uh, they can have a lot of people listening to podcasts about it or uh, television or write articles. But when it comes to actually caring about burnout, they don't seem to care. What they do seem to care is asking about stuff that they want them yesterday or uh, putting extra pressure to people to over-deliver. Sometimes they're even understaffed and they still don't hear to their uh, employees' needs. So if we don't have an organizational environment based on open and clear communication, where people are actually allowed and encouraged and embraced when they're speaking up and when they're telling their own truth by actually not suffering any repercussions when this truth might be uncomfortable for the leadership or for the managers, then we can't be talking about mental health in the workspace. The second angle is, like we said, our colleagues. Our colleagues should be our teammates, should be our support system in the workspace. But then again, the responsibility for that falls once again on the organizational side. If our corporate culture is a culture that promotes competition in the workspace and uh, promotes even unhealthy competition, then it's very hard for people to have each other's back and look for each other. And this, of course, is wrong when it comes to prioritizing mental health and well-being in the workspace. We want people that care about each other and care in a positive way, in a way that I want to help you. And if we both grow together, then that's going to be more beneficial for the business as well. And not people that are just looking for opportunities to benefit from someone's bad place in order to move forward in the hierarchy. And then finally, like I mentioned, in my opinion, the most important angle is the personal one. Because if I myself don't take care of my mental health, and if I don't prioritize my own mental health by setting clear boundaries, by speaking up, by sharing my needs, not in uh, a second place and in a second time when I don't have any control on how I'm going to express this need, but when I actually have the issue and I am still in control and I am in a position to express myself in a healthy and understanding way, then how do I expect anyone to care about my mental health? Let me put it clear. Um, companies are exposed to a lot of changes, what we call exponential change. Things are changing all the time. And what I generally see is that people do not know how to establish these kind of healthy steps when they interact with each other, but also they have unrealistic goals that, you know, everyone knows that uh, someone is not going to achieve it. But then they produce a lot of stress. And then you have the youth stress when someone is able to cope with this, but then the stress when people are not able to cope with this. So leaders also sometimes, you know, leaders are not machines, are like human beings like anyone else, and they do not know how to establish a healthy interaction or healthy step with others in order to, to promote a healthy company. And one of the things we 
we were talking um, a few weeks ago with Dr. Andre Vermeulen, he's a neuroscientist, and he mentioned that it can take years since um, you start having a suffering some kind of situation in the company until uh, you realize you have a burnout. So tell me, uh, let's start with very basic, because someone might not know the behaviors that are good and the behaviors that are bad. Can you give me at least two or three examples of good behaviors? Let's talk just about behaviors and bad behaviors you see in a company that it might allow people to identify where they are at least. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, usually though, I would like to mention that it's not taking years because the cultures that are promoting burnout in the sense that they don't prevent it and in the sense that they don't prioritize mental health, they take so much you know, less time to act upon people and establish a stress culture and the burnout situation. So most of the times when a person finds themselves in an environment that burnout is allowed to happen, then it's going to be much, much sooner. It's not going to take so many years because usually these environments are very fast paced and they're very competitive and uh, they perpetuate unhealthy competition between the team members. Uh, concerning now the behaviors, uh, if I got it right, I think you're asking me about which are good and bad behaviors from the management's uh, point of view. To oh, leadership, people. yes. Okay. A good behavior is to respect uh, your personnel's free time. Many companies don't respect free time. That means that they can cancel uh, someone's leave even without a very specific or important reason. They might be calling after work hours. They might be calling during weekends. They might be sending emails uh, in, during the night and then expecting that the person has actually read them first thing in the morning. So this is not a behavior that's helping. Uh, another thing that is very uh, challenging for most of the people is when an organization doesn't have a clear structure. This is something that we tend to underestimate, but people inside organizations, they shouldn't be uh, responsible for figuring out which is the, their place and their role inside the organization. It should be the management and the organization's responsibility to help them figure out where they're standing. So an organization without a clear structure, without a clear hierarchy, without a clear succession planning, when you don't know who you're supposed to talk to and uh, who is doing what or what are the next steps you should be following in order to achieve a specific career, that puts people under a lot of stress. Because when somebody, especially for overachievers and especially for people that uh, really care about progressing in their career, it's much easier to end up over delivering and over putting effort and giving more than they have than actually giving less because of ambiguous uh, situations in the workplace. And then when it comes to good behaviors, I would say that uh, establishing a culture where uh, feedback is both allowed and encouraged and uh, there is a feedback in a 360 approach where employees are also able to give the feedback about their managers is the most important thing. How often do management actually ask the employees about whether they appreciate their management style and how they're feeling in this organization? The funny thing is that when it comes to mental health, people tend to act as if it's dark arts, but it's not dark arts. Everyone knows what's best for them. It's just that nobody asks them. And now one question to ask you before Sylvia goes, and I know Sylvia probably have many, many questions in mind. It is that several times, as, as you said, people do not understand what they have to do. They need to find out what to do in organizations. And, and, and sometimes it's taken like um, it is good for them to do it because they need it to show they are productive. So if I join an organization where I have to discover what to do, it's great. And I wanted to mention here before Sylvia goes, um, I saw an advertising in a newspaper, I believe it's in Colombia, a few weeks ago. It was on all the Spanish groups uh, all around. A company asking for, um, I think it was a product owner or someone like this, and it says immune to stress. And then I think if, if a company is asking for someone to be immune to a stress, it's it giving me some signals that 
in this company there is a, a lot of stress, right? How how can um, be someone immune to stress? I have no idea. But then I, let's let's pass it the ball now to Silvia. Silvia, all yours. So you go for this. I know you have a great question. Was um, listening to to Zoe and um, and, and 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 you talking about leadership and what is coming to mind is that um, there are some estimates and, and statistics that managers, uh, for example, account for at least 70% of variance in employee engagement scores, right, across um, units. So, um, and, and this is very related to, 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 to burnout, right? So uh, in, in that sense, how, how much do you, um, or, or to what extent do you think engagement plays a role in the burnout, with burnout? Engagement per se, is not a negative aspect. We want people to be engaged and we want people to be engaged in our culture and we want people to feel organizational commitment because that's what makes a great employee. Uh, that's what helps us keep them. That's what helps us grow. But you can't force engagement. That's the problem. You can't force chemistry and you can't force for equal values. This is there or it is not there. And if it's not there, the responsibility to create it doesn't fall on the employee. The responsibility falls on the organization and the management team. What Eric said, uh, I need an employee that is immune to stress. And he said that, you know, that means that the environment creates a lot of stress. That, by default, is not a problem because, of course, there are so many jobs that create a lot of stress. If you are an ER doctor, nobody expects you know, to have stress for this job. It's an important job. Of course, you're going to have stress. The lack of accountability is the problem. The, the problem is that in, instead of saying that we have this problem, we create a lot of stress, and we're going to do one, two, three to, to help people manage it, no, the people have the problem. We just haven't found the appropriate people. We need people that are immune to stress. One of the most basic human reactions. And this is like saying um, you are immune, immune to happiness. Um, I think emotions are there for a reason. It's telling your body, don't go, don't cross this river because maybe dangerous, or just walk in this way because it's sunny there. I think the, 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 the beauty of being human beings is trying to understand your feelings and trying to see in which direction to go instead of trying to be immune to them. And at, at, when a company is asking for this, I think it, it, something is, is, is not in the right place. Now, Imagine that you have a team. I imagine you have been working with several teams around the world. And this team, you detect that is in a position where they are stressed. The, some of the members can be close to a burnout, maybe. Um, what you do? What's the first thing you do? What's your recommendation in a company? How you detect that? How you see what, what the smell in those parts of the company? Well, the first thing that I do personally is I ask the management, why do they think that uh, their teams are in this situation? And then I ask the teams the exact same question. And then I laugh a lot with the difference between the answers. <laughs> when I am done laughing, I go back to the management and they say, why do you think we have this discrepancy? Why do you think that, you know, you mentioned that the people are stressed because of coronavirus, but they say that they're stressed because there was this change in leadership that nobody let them know about. Uh, there was this uh, announcement that nobody explained and you promised some bonuses that you never gave. So first of all, we need to map the situation and understand the real reasons behind people work stressed. After we assess it, then we run with interventions depending what the real problem is. But the important thing in my opinion in this situation is not to make assumptions. Use scientists use HR business partners, use a consultant. Don't do it yourself because if you are the person or you are the manager that created the burnout, obviously people won't be feeling comfortable sharing with you that you are the source of their issues. Therefore, if you really care about solving this problem, you need to bring in a third party that is independent and they can run their own surveys and they can give you uh, their opinion and they review, and then I, if I'm the manager, I need to have the maturity to deal and understand what this report is saying. 
Now, I think it's um, important before before Sylvia goes. I'm sorry, Sylvia. I, I have something I want to mention here. I was working in a company in London and I remember there was a psychopathic person, at least I believe he was. Um, one day I arrived to the office and, and I was a scrum coach. That was around 2007. And I saw people crying and you know, very stressed. Um, and the guy said, well, you know, this person, this manager always come here and hit, uh, you know, the table and ask for requests. And, and then I started realizing that he, he has some kind of psychopathic traits. And it was very tough to work with these people. It was very mani manipulative. Um, this person did not engage into the feelings of others, etc. And I remember taking the, the, the team asked me for uh, to do a meeting where they wanted to tell this person, the possible psychopathic person, how they were feeling. And and I said, okay, let's organize this. And something that you need to understand is never put a crazy guy in in, in a meeting if people don't feel safe. So I did the meeting. This guy wanted to wanted to tell the boss how they were feeling. And then when I asked the question, okay, guys, can you tell me how you're feeling? What happened here? Why you asked me to do this meeting? And the guy said, well, you know, this is the, the, the best time in the company. We are very happy here. So people were very afraid of talking. And, and sometimes uh, this is part of um, in certain organizations, when you try to get feedback, you do not get the right feedback because people do not feel safe. And, and let me just, let's go quickly for that, as I know Sylvia has so the question is, how you assess first, because obviously you, otherwise you get the wrong feedback, if the person, if people feel safe in the company before trying to get some feedback, because otherwise the feedback is useless. Mm -hmm. By running anonymous surveys. Uh, it can be okay. very high tech, like creating a form, sending it to people and they fulfill it anonymously, and then you get anonymous feedback. Or it can even be old school. If you remember back in the day, uh, companies used to have what we called uh, a box for complaints. So the method is there. It's just that people don't want to implement it. And obviously, yeah. Uh, yeah. another thing uh, is that most of the times we assume that what management doesn't know that there is a psychopathetic person in the group. Of course they know. They just don't want to handle it because usually the person that is the psychopathetic person in the group is also the one that produces the more sales or has the biggest accounts in the company. And this is exactly, why they don't, exactly. Exactly. They don't want it. Yes, exactly. They don't want to address it. So obviously uh, this wasn't a feedback session. This was a charade. If you, you know, there is no manager that doesn't understand who creates the problem inside the organization. They know. And, they can't handle it or they can't handle it. And I understand both cases because, of course, especially in a small organization, if you have a very challenging and problematic person that's also generating the biggest uh, revenue for the company, it's not always so easy. It's not black and white. But you can not handle it as an active decision that I can't do anything about it right now. I know it's a problem but I can't handle it right now. And this is a completely different state of mind than pretending that there is no problem and being in denial and then creating this situation like you described, putting all the people around and asking them who's the problem and by having the bully of the group uh, in the center of the table. Sylvia, all yours. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. There is a lot of um, information that, that we're getting from, from Zoe, right? Um, I'm thinking about, because this is something that also we, we, we do at um, the Enterprise Agility University, um, uh, we have some techniques to, to, to measure, right? Um, to measure, to sense, rather, uh, rather than, better than measuring, I guess the, the right word is to sense, to sense the employees, to sense the individuals, the people, not only the people that work um, with us in an organization, we, for example, as a leaders, but uh, also we can also sense customers, we can sense the, all the ecosystem. So what do you think about, because probably you, you were talking about more from a, from a more high level or holistic or integral view from the organization, but what about um, the leaders, the leaders having 
open, transparent, and meaningful conversations and having the opportunity, you mentioned that also before, frequent feedback, uh, one-on-ones, all that, where they can really sense uh, what is going on with each person. Because sometimes mm -hmm. even the person know and, and they understand that, oh, I am, I'm living on stress, but they don't realize that they are about to <laughs> become burnt out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, obviously I am a pro 100% transparent cultures and open communication and like I mentioned, 360 feedback. And uh, I don't believe in silos. I don't believe they're helpful. And I don't believe in the old school management that uh, you need to be uh, a boss that creates a lot of distance. Otherwise, if they don't fear you, they don't respect you. I don't think that these uh, things actually work. They're beneficial to specific people's egos, but not necessarily for the organization. Uh, but having said that, not everyone knows how to give feedback. So if I come to you, Sylvia, and I tell you, oh my God, this report that you did is awful, take it back and do it again. This is not feedback. This is a bad review. This is a judgment and it's not helpful. Because if I come to you for feedback, I need to propose to you something as well. Like this report is bad. I think that it lacks one, two, three, and this is, do this change there and bring it back again. We have leaders that haven't been trained into being leaders. I am working as a coach with uh, CTOs all over the world. And most of the times what happens with these CTOs is that they are amazing developers that grow inside their organization to be VP of engineer, et cetera. And in the end, they become CTOs. And these people usually, they're introverts in their nature and nobody has trained them into leading a team. So suddenly from the one day, they are writing code in a room and the next day they have to manage a team of 20 other introverts. And none of them is able to communicate clearly what they need. So on the one hand, like I said, of course I am pro-feedback and open communication between managers and uh, employees. But at the same time, I do believe that managers need to be trained. The, the, the variance in, 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 in this employee engagement is 7% driven by managers. Right. So um, and, and, and this variation is in turn responsible for severely low vo worldwide employee engagement. So, um, yeah, I guess that um, leaders should be developed further. Right. Because um, this all starts with building trust. Right. That's a foundation because employees <laughs> will not be open to any leader who is not capable of building that trust, knowing their employees, knowing how to, what ticks, what makes them tick, right? To, to have a better understanding, to listen to work-related problems, encourage teamwork, as you said, right? It's important for people to feel supported by their peers, right? It's mm -hmm. like one of the Maslow pyramid uh, basic mm -hmm. needs as well, right? Um, yeah, and you also mentioned that, um, the importance of when 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 everyone everyone's opinion counts, right? When they are able to or um, feel free to speak up, they feel safe to speak up. And, so and this is important, Sylvia, as I think that uh, people might feel that they they speak up, but then nobody pay attention to them, right? And then they don't influence anyone. Yeah, that's right. an, exactly that's something I would like to mention that. Above mm -hmm. all, the most important thing is consistency. Even if you have nothing else, as long as you have consistency, people are still better. So if you are in an environment that doesn't prioritize uh, mental health, doesn't care, let's say, about diversity and inclusion, and doesn't care about people's opinions, then that on its own, it's not necessarily a problem as long as it's clear and people know up front what kind of an organization they're entering to. In that sense, a flyer that says, I want an employee that's immune to stress might be more healthy for an employee than a flyer that says, we look for super creative people and uh, 
uh, innovation ninjas that will uh, join our team. And this is an amazing opportunity for you to be part of something great. And then they join this, believing that that's what's actually going to happen. And then they're actually never being heard. So if anything, once again, honestly, and the other person knowing where they're standing when it comes to this culture, it's much more important and healthy than telling yes, their them, choice. Mm -hmm. Yes, and creating promises that the organization can keep. Yeah. And well, for me, when it comes to the I'm mm -hmm. oh, sorry, sorry, go ahead, go ahead. I was going to say that uh, for me, uh, my PhD is actually in corporate culture. So it's kind of my, uh, like a dark poison of a subject. And uh, I tend to approach corporate cultures like Jenga's. Have you ever played Jenga? Like, yes. you put this book? Okay, as long Not as me. it's standing. Okay, it's a game with, uh, you have these small pieces, like puzzle pieces, and you put them one on top of the other. And oh you try yeah, to make I it. play that. Yes. Okay, yes. It and makes you try me to make nervous. it not collapse. <laughs> so when it comes to organizations, in a sense, for me they're like jengas. As long as it's standing and it's not falling, okay, somehow it's functional. Even if it looks weird, if it, even if it doesn't make sense, it's still functional. So I don't necessarily believe that there is an element that's necessarily wrong with a corporate culture, even if it's competition, because there are people that are competitive. The problem is when you don't know what your culture is, so you recruit the wrong kind of people by making false promises. Yeah. yeah and also, the, the, the point here. Uh -huh. Yeah, go, go, Sylvia. Yeah, sorry. You have to. Yeah, uh, go. For example, in thinking about the Jenga, right, when you are just taking out um, each um, um, piece of uh, wood or whatever the material is. It's like, okay, you, you are about to fail, right? What happens when, when there is a big disruption, right? Uh, an exponential change that can move everything if you have no, not clear foundations. Yeah, mm -hmm. because this is what we're living today, right? So we, we are, we are um, facing um market disruptions and, and exponential changes all the time so this is kind of the new normal right yeah but that's not necessarily bad also we shouldn't be afraid of change and we shouldn't be afraid of going down Absolutely. so we have to pick up again and you know be destroying our to, thing and it. to build it safer so sometimes you know letting the whole thing fall down in order to build it again in a better and healthier and more solid way it's better than just you know praying that no wind will blow to just take it off because you had no idea what you were doing when you were building it. Okay. Yes, and something important here is about culture. Culture is sometimes not the same in one company than another because if you take a look at many companies, right? Same brand, but different offices. Maybe you go to this company in one part of the country and then the behavior and people feel safe or people feel it in a different way that you, if you go in a, in a different office. So culture is very specific to the region and that's why we, we cannot sometimes try to uh, make it homogeneous, the decisions we make, because of the, uh, I've seen a company where they have offices in Malta and in Spain, and in Spain everyone ha was happy, and in Malta, which is a super happy country, everyone was uh, miserable, but the, the I wanted to mention something important here is that I have a friend of mine working for a corporate company, big, huge company, and they have to come back to the offices uh, just last week. Now, when they came back, the office uh, decided to move to a fancy new building in a floor, I think it's 26, um, used to the sea, etc. But they told them, well, from now onwards, you don't have a fixed seat. You have to come here every day and see where you sit. Uh, you don't have a place where, um, where, where you store your things on the, on the first floor and then you go up. So the, the, before they told me this, uh, you know, this desk, I felt like it was mine. I decorated it. I have my stuff there. I eventually could uh, bring some food from home. And then now I cannot, I cannot even, you know, do anything there. And, and this is the kind of decision that you generally see in companies. I don't know from where companies get this 
crazy ideas, but I think that if people feel more comfortable in the office, they they produce better. But they, they, and they say, well, this is much modern. Have you seen these kind of things after pandemic? Companies trying to do things that might uh, produce the opposite effect. Mm. And I'm talking specifically uh, about the environment, changes in the environment yeah. after pandemic. Yeah, I don't think even has, before pandemic. <laughs> yeah, I was I was about to say the same that I don't think it has to do with the pandemic. I think to do that, I think it has to do with the fact that many companies can't stop treating their employees as if they are their spouses, and they have a relationship with them, and they have to surprise them. They don't understand that the concept of surprise doesn't exist in business. People are scared of change. Uh, culture change projects, they have over 90% failure rate. And from the 10% that actually succeeds, less than 3% succeeds the exact same goals that they set when they started. And this is how much people are afraid of change uh, in an organizational environment. So if you want to do something so big, like changing offices and changing location and uh, changing the routine and uh, moving on to an open place and an uh, open work environment, this needs to be communicated very slowly and uh, ask for feedback and letting them know, explaining very clearly how things are going to change and what's going to happen and why you're doing that so that people feel confident that there is a plan behind this change and that uh, they are able to transforming this change as well, and they are able to accommodate uh, this change, and above all, that their positions are safe, because sometimes companies, let's say, they have a very the greatest of the motives. Well, employees still work for money, so when they see changes that they don't understand, always in the back of their heads, what exists is okay. What does this mean for me? Uh, am I still going to have my job? Uh, did they spend all the budget on the offices, and now they have to? cut people uh, loose. So Celia, I leave you the, the last question and we have just four minutes before we go. Okay. All yours. Yes. Okay. Um, there are several um, things that can lead to, and probably uh, you have heard that uh, a lot, the term quiet quitting, um, okay. such as lack of confidence, lack of consistency perceiving that you are not valued, lack of sense of belonging, which is related to what we were just talking about, lack of communication, or that is not that the communication is not um, efficient and clear, and that everything that leads to burnout, right, um, um, and, 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 and disconnection. So what do you think about this can this be considered as a, a trigger of burnout or to burnout or a consequence of burnout? Uh, it uh, definitely is. I mean, it can be and it can be at the same time in a sense that quiet quitting can be one of the burnout symptoms in a sense that I'm in a mental situation that I don't have the emotional capacity to address what's happening at the work right now. So my productivity becomes lower and... Uh, I start missing a lot and having a lot of absenteeism and uh, I'm not able to deliver the way I was delivering. But at the same time, uh, not every person that's quite quitting is because of burnout. There are many people that, you know, they, they also might have changed themselves. And sometimes people don't feel comfortable transforming this change into actions. So they prefer to, you know, start separating themselves and getting some distance until the situation becomes so unbearable that someone else has to take the active decision of letting them go instead of them actively saying, okay, this isn't working anymore for me. It's not you, it's me. <laughs> I need some time for myself, <laughs> etc. Well, unfortunately, I have so many right. questions for you. I know that Sylvia also does uh, want to ask more questions, but I think the opportunity now is to embrace into this conversation in the Enterprise Agility World Conference. I wanted to thank first Sylvia for uh, texting me yesterday around one in the morning saying I want to be there. <laughs> thank you Sylvia for joining today from Uruguay and also Zoe I appreciate your time today. I hope uh, 
we meet soon and in fact we are going to see each other in 45 days at the enterprise security world conference is there any anything else you want you have 40 seconds and you want to go ahead any recommendation anything else you want to finish okay if i have 40 seconds <laughs> and then need to finish with a recommendation i'd like to tell everyone happy new season we just came back from vacation so let's make sure that this year it's going to be better and more fruitful than the previous ones and let's all try to make you know if it is to make one uh, uh, goal for this year uh, let's prioritize our mental health well, thank you very much, Zoe. I hope to see you at the Enterprise Agility Web Conference in November. Also remember, we're going to have a translation in now 35 languages. I think we're going to get Arabic soon, 36. Let's see. And I hope to see you soon. Thank you for your time today. And I hope, guys, wherever you are in the world, just sense yourself, know where you are, and, and then start making some changes. Remember, the best way to make a change is to start in somewhere where you feel comfortable and then moving from there onwards. So yes. thank you very much. So we do not do not move, disappear because we're going to take a, a few minutes with Sylvia and you, five minutes, just to have a quick conversation. So guys, I will see you tomorrow. Hope you have a great day wherever you are in the world. And thank you for joining today. Thank you, Zoe and Sylvia again. The world is more complex than ever before, moving and changing at an incredible rate. No one is immune, not even the most successful leaders of today's best-known companies. We are taking the global industry to new assumptions, beyond agile and business agility. Be ready to understand the science behind high uncertainty and accelerated change. Be ready to challenge your organization. Join us at the Enterprise Agility World Conference to know more. The largest event on science, organizational change, and enterprise agility. Enterprise Agility World Conference. The place where science meets organizational change.